So today's video is going to be part two of the Hungerford Massacre. I'm just going to give you a quick recap and then we'll just get straight into it. If you didn't catch part one, I'll pop it up here in the eye. Make sure you watch that one before you watch this one because this one won't make much sense. So Michael Robert Ryan is a 27 year old man from Hungerford in England who decided on one day in August in 1987 that he was going to go out and commit a massacre. He started in a forest named Savanac Forest. He killed a woman named Susan Godfrey in front of her two children but spared the children. He then went to a petrol station and attempted another murder on the cashier at the petrol station but his gun didn't work and so he just fled and went back to Hungerford. Once he got back to Hungerford he set his home on fire grabbed three of his guns and began shooting at his neighbours. So far in the case, he has killed five people and injured a further five or six more. Those five deaths include Susan from the forest, like I said, an elderly couple named the Masons, a police officer named PC Brereton and a man named Kenneth Clements who was walking with his children. So far the majority of the massacre has taken place on Southview which is where he lives. At this point again Michael realises that he has got all he can get from Southview. He'd reloaded his guns, no more cars were coming up, none of the neighbours were coming out and so he decides to move on, on foot. He got onto a road named Fairview Road and he was listening out for another victim and heard voices coming from a back garden of a house and so he follows them and goes into that back garden. There he found 84 year old Abdul Khan just enjoying the nice summer day in his back garden and Michael Ryan shot and killed him. Michael then went back up onto Southview, got the rest of his ammunition out of the boot of his car realizing that it was easier on foot and on the move to go to all these different places. There were new victims. So he's getting all the ammunition out of his car when another car turns up onto Southview. This time it was Julie Jackson's husband, Ivor Jackson, the one that she called from the house saying that she was injured and he was being driven there by his friend, George White. As soon as Michael spotted the car, he began shooting. First at George White, he only needed to shoot him once and he killed him instantly. He then moved on to Ivor Jackson, who he shot quite a few times in the chest, in the shoulder, in the arm and so Ivor kind of collapsed and realised that he wasn't dead. He thought he was probably gonna die but he thought the best option at this point was to just play dead and hope that Michael didn't shoot him again. And literally straight after that another car comes up South View but this time it was Dorothy Ryan, Michael's own mother on her way back from her job interview. Actually, as she was driving towards Southview, so before she'd even got onto the street, she had no idea that any of this was going on. A neighbor had actually tried to flag her down on another road saying like, whoa, don't go down there. Like I've heard there's a gunman down there. There's a lot going on, stay safe. But anyway, she ignored this man. She turned onto Southview and then she realized the devastation. She saw two cars smashed into each other of course, when George White was shot and killed, the car just continued going and crashed into the back of PC Brereton's. She saw these two cars all smashed up, all the windows blown out. She saw all the houses on the street with their windows blown out. And then she looks up and sees her own son standing there at the end of the road with two big guns strapped to him, another one in his hand, in the middle of all of this devastation. So she stops the car, she flies out and tries to reason with him. She's shouting to him saying, please, Michael, stop, put the guns down. She's holding her hands up, she's surrendering. She approached these two cars, the one with Ivor and George in and the one with PC Brereton in, and she spots Ivor in the passenger seat of the car. He was still alive, he did survive his injuries, but he was playing dead. And so she also thought that he was dead. And she looked at him and said, Oh, not you as well, Ivor. She continued up the road to Michael and she was shouting, Michael, please stop, stop. To which he turned round, saw his own mother standing there pleading with him. But at this point, I don't think anyone could have stopped Michael Ryan. And he stood there and shot his own mother to death. Psychologists think at this point that Michael Ryan almost snapped out of it, but not entirely. He kind of he must have come down a peg at least in this kind of psychotic mental state that he was in because instead of going on to a different road now to go and find more victims he just went for a walk 
across Hungerford Common, maybe to calm himself down, maybe to think about what he'd just done. He made it to the other side of the common where there was kind of like a kid's play area. There was like a climbing frame, a slide, there was an outdoor pool and obviously with it being a really warm summer's day in the middle of the school holidays, there was about 20 or so children there with their families. But this is something you might have already noticed about Michael Ryan is that he doesn't seem to want to target children. He's had plenty of opportunities with the children in Savanac Forest, with Keith Clement's son. He's had plenty of opportunities and chooses to spare the children. That's something we'll talk about a bit more at the end of the video when we look at his psychology and stuff like that. But for now, he gets to this kind of playground part of Hungerford Common and he began targeting only the adults. A man named Francis Butler was out walking his dog that day in the memorial garden and I believe his dog was like off its lead or maybe just on a really long lead. It was off in the grass at this point and he'd literally only just entered the gates of the park when Michael Ryan shot him dead. A man named Dean has since told his version of events of that day. He was actually a child in the playground at the time that this was going on and the playground was right next to the path so the children saw everything. Dean remembered hearing these really sudden loud banging noises and so he turned round to see Francis Butler still stood up in the gateway just smoke around his feet from where the bullets had obviously hit the ground and then suddenly Francis falls to the floor and within a few seconds is in a pool of his own blood and then the kids turned to the direction that the shots came in and there was kind of like a tree in front of the climbing frame so they couldn't see the path on the other side and as he was getting closer obviously more of him was visible from behind the tree so Dean remembers seeing feet and then legs and then a torso with guns strapped to it and suddenly all these 20 or so children on this climbing frame began running in the opposite direction going to Dean's house. Michael Ryan eventually caught up to where Francis Butler was now slumped on the floor probably already dead and he shot him one more time at point blank range just to make sure that he was dead and then he carried on as if nothing had just happened. As Michael got to the road, he spotted a car, just a taxi on its way to pick up its next passenger and he took that as an opportunity to claim another victim and he shot about five or six rounds into the car. The taxi driver was named Marcus Bernard. He was killed almost instantly, making him Michael Ryan's 10th victim of the day. And we actually have an eyewitness from this point because even though everyone at the park had run away, one man that lived pretty much next to the park saw all of this going on from his driveway. It was a couple that lived in this house next to the park, Mr. Hall and Mrs. Hall. Mrs. Hall was was up in the bedroom window at the front of the house watching all of this go on while of course Mr Hall was on the drive and Mr Hall recalls watching Michael Ryan shoot the taxi driver and then pick up his gun off of his body like it was strapped to his body he picked it up and looked at it almost in disgust. Now of course you can't tell just from looking at someone what they're thinking there's multiple different things he could have been thinking or feeling in that moment maybe he was disgusted in himself Maybe he was shocked at his actions. Maybe he didn't want to carry this on, but felt like it had already gone too far. Or, a lot of people believe maybe the gun just jammed and he was angry at the gun, not at himself for using the gun. But the Halls witnessed him look at this gun in disgust and then take it off of his body, take the strap off his body and just slam it on the floor. And then he continued with just his semi-automatic and a pistol which makes me think that the gun probably jammed or broke or something. But before Michael got too far down the road, he heard Mr. Hall behind him and turned round to see him and immediately began shooting. Straight away, Mr. Hall turned round and ran back into his house and luckily not one of the shots hit him. He wasn't even injured. And Michael realized that he wasn't gonna hit him. And so he just turned round and carried on down the road and went and carried on his massacre. At this point, police are desperate for more men, be it people back at the police station, people to answer the phones, people to actually go out and look after the town, people to barricade different roads. So they were even calling in people that had days off and, you know, ex-police officers, just anyone that could come in and help them that was even a little bit qualified. And this included PC Trevor Wainwright. It was actually his day off at the time and he was away from home. However, his wife, 
wife had already called him letting him know what was going on in Hungerford so he was already on his way home to come and protect his wife. As he was driving back into Hungerford he passed Hungerford Common and saw all this smoke behind and obviously at the time he didn't know that this was coming from Michael Ryan's house or that it was even connected to the gunman. He carried on driving until he drove past a group of people that were kind of huddled in some trees on the side of the road and so he pulled over and got out of the car to go and ask them what was going on and they were very clearly frantic saying there's a man with a gun on the loose we're just trying to hide. So PC Trevor Wainwright knew what he had to do. He made his way home, he checked on his wife, made sure that she was safe at home, locked the doors behind him and then went to the police station to work on this operation. When he got there his colleagues informed him that they thought that the perpetrator was a man named Michael Ryan and Trevor Wainwright was very confused because he'd never heard this name before. Trevor used to coach the young men's football club in the town so he knew most of the young men around Michael's age in the town. He either coached most of the boys or knew most of the boys through the ones he coached. It was very rare that he came across someone Michael's age and had never heard of them before. At this point, it had been almost an hour since Michael Ryan's killing spree began. It was around 1.30 p.m. and the firearm squad were almost in Hungerford. But of course, the firearm squad, because they weren't local to Hungerford, they lived elsewhere, they would have probably struggled to navigate. And because it was all done by police radio, it's okay for local police officers to say, oh, go to this street because local people will know where that is but the firearm squad since they don't live there they won't know places based on street names so PC Wainwright decided to go into town risk his own life go into the center of Hungerford and go and get as many street maps as he could find for these firearms police officers. As he got into town he could really sense the fear in the public. There were just rows and rows of police cars, ambulances, fire engines all waiting to go and do their job as soon as it was deemed safe. They were all blocking off certain roads so that people couldn't go down there. There was ambulances giving people medical help. There were people huddling in different shops and doorways and anywhere they could get that was kind of out of the way to make sure that they were safe. So PC Wainwright ran in to the nearest news agents and just said give me every single map of Hungerford that you've got and he took them all back to the police station for the firearm squad who were finally in Hungerford however no one knew where Michael Ryan was like I said earlier he was on the move so it was hard to track him and they hadn't got a phone call in a while reporting him and saying he's on this street so they didn't know where to start. PC Wainwright had actually planned on going with the firearms team in the helicopters or in the police cars or wherever they were going because he knew his way around Hungerford. He was quite high up in the police force. However, just as he was about to leave the police station with them, his sergeant called him into his office and gave him some devastating news that there'd been an 11th victim of Michael Ryan's and it was PC Wainwright's own father, Douglas Wainwright. Douglas and his wife Kathleen, PC Wainwright's parents, actually lived over two hours away from Hungerford in Kent. However, they were surprised visiting their son on that day. They weren't supposed to be there. Trevor didn't know that they were gonna be there, which makes this all the more upsetting. They were just trying to see their son and surprise him and spend some time with him over summer when they drove straight into Michael Ryan's massacre. Michael Ryan had shot Douglas as he and Kathleen had been driving past. He only got him once in the head, but that was enough to kill him instantly. Kathleen luckily was not injured. She was able to crawl out of the car and hide until Michael Ryan had left. And then one of the neighbours bravely came out of their house and kind of ushered her inside their house to safety. Michael Ryan then moved on to another street named Priory Road and killed his 12th victim, Eric Vardy. Eric, just like Douglas, had just been driving his van on a normal day when he was shot and killed. And as all of this had been going on, a local man named Carl Harries had heard the gunshots and decided that he had to do something. Carl Harries was a former army man and so as soon as he heard these noises he knew that they were from a semi-automatic, he recognised it. Whereas other people could mistake it for other noises, he knew exactly what it was and so he knew that he needed to help someone. He was a very, very, very brave man. So Harry's went out to investigate and he got to the bottom of Priory Road and as soon as he looked up, 
you saw Michael Ryan standing there with these guns strapped to him. He was aiming at the houses on Priory Road, shooting through the windows. Presumably he'd seen people inside, seen shadows or whatever, and he was trying to kill the people in the houses. So Harry saw him at the other side of the road and knew if he even turned round, Harry's would be dead as well. So he decided to take cover against a wall. So this wall had like a bush growing over it. So he could press himself against the wall and kind of hide in the leaves. He stayed there for a couple of minutes and it was just dead silence. And so he thought, well, maybe he's moved on. And so Harry's decided to come out of the bush and as he did, Michael Ryan was still there. He turned and saw Harry's and immediately started shooting at him. Harry's turned and ran and just dove straight through one of the nearest hedges that connected to someone's garden. So now he was in someone's garden. He just jumped straight through this bush. So he was laid there for a second. He assessed himself to make sure that he wasn't hurt, that he hadn't been shocked. So obviously he was in a lot of shock. There was a lot of adrenaline. So he could have been hit and he might not have noticed. He might not have felt it. He double checked himself and he wasn't injured at all. So he got up out of this garden, made his way back onto Priory Road where Michael Ryan was, where he'd just been shooting at him and watched as Michael Michael Ryan walked around the edge of the road. He turned the corner. So now Harry's knew exactly where he was. But before Harry's could follow him up that road, that was his plan to follow him up the road, he saw a red car rolling down the hill. It wasn't driving, it was just rolling very slowly. So he ran and caught up to this car and stopped it. And that was when he realized that the driver of the car was slumped over and bleeding. It was Michael Ryan's 13th victim, a 22 year old woman named Sandra Hill and she'd been shot and killed as she was just driving. So Harry's opened the car door and like tried to get her out and take her over to a grass verge when a neighbor came up behind him and offered to help. Obviously people were in their windows watching all of this happen because they were scared and they wanted to know what was going on but they were too scared to go outside. So these two men carried Sandra Hill's body over to the nearest grass verge and they laid her down. They were kind of assessing her wounds and everything but it seemed as though she wasn't gonna make it. An elderly woman even came out of her house with a little plastic first aid box and offered it to Carl Harry's and said, I know it's not much, but maybe you can do something with it. Of course, it only had like plasters and little antiseptic wipes in. Meanwhile, the police helicopter was finally repaired and in action. They sent it up to go and try and locate Michael Ryan because it was very hard to do via you know, people calling the police station. So they sent a couple of firearms officers up in this helicopter. And it's believed that Michael Ryan saw this helicopter in the sky and thought, well, how can he get away from it? How can he make sure that he isn't seen by this helicopter? And his solution was to just invade people's homes. And if he had to shoot the occupants, he had to shoot them. Michael broke into two houses. The first was that of an elderly couple named Myrtle and Victor Gibbs. He walked in and shot the two of them in the kitchen, killing Victor instantly and seriously injuring Myrtle. He then goes across the road and breaks into a man named Michael Jennings' home and shoots him and gets him in the leg. Michael Jennings collapses and so Michael Ryans thinks that he's killed him and so he just leaves the house and moves on. However, Michael Jennings is just injured. Michael Ryan then goes across the road and he doesn't break into this house but he sees someone through the window. So he shoots through the window and seriously injures a woman named Myra Gita. Carl Harry's at this point was just sat on that grass verge with Sandra Hill and the neighbour and they were waiting for an ambulance but they could hear all of these gunshots going on on this other street and Carl knew that he couldn't just stay there. There was no point in him staying with Sandra because she was already gone at this point and they were just waiting for an ambulance to come and confirm that. But he knew that he could potentially be saving lives on this other street and so he gets up and he goes there. But the problem he faced with going onto this street is that once he turned the corner, it was straight all the way up. So even from the bottom, if Michael Ryan even so much as turned a little bit, he would see him. And if he saw Carl Harry's, of course he's gonna start shooting at him. And so Carl had to think of a way to get up the road without being seen. He debated it for a moment, standing at the bottom of the street thinking, is this really worth it? It was such a risk. The likelihood was that if he even tried to go up there, he wouldn't survive it. But he knew that there was a small chance that he would and that he could save people. 
and so he decided that he was going to do it regardless. So Carl Harry set off up this road but did it very strategically. So on one side there was cars parked pretty much all just one after another and so he thought if he kind of stuck down and stuck behind them he'd be able to hide himself from Michael Ryan pretty much all the way up. He was walking for a little bit and then he realised that he hadn't actually heard a gunshot in a while so he decided to peek over the top of the car just to make sure that Michael Ryan was even still there and when he did Michael Ryan was on the other side of the car, pretty much just a few feet away from him. Luckily he didn't see Carl Harry's and so he ducked back down and rolled under the car to make sure that Michael couldn't see him. And listening to Carl Harry's describe this is something like out of a horror movie. He was laid there underneath this car for so long watching Michael Ryan's boots just walk backwards and forwards past the car. Eventually he watched as Michael Ryan went all the way to the end of the road and turned off. And it was almost at the same time that a woman began screaming and Carl Harry's knew that he had to go and help this woman. So Carl got up and ran up the road and quickly identified that this screaming was coming from a car that had kind of veered off and almost crashed into a wall. There was a woman in the passenger seat who was screaming but she didn't seem too injured. She had blood on her but she didn't seem to be in a bad way and then he looked at the driver's seat to see a man slumped over, clearly already dead. So Harry's went round to the driver's seat and he began trying to get this man out of the car. He laid him on the floor at the back and this woman the whole time is of course frantic saying my husband my husband I'm a nurse and so Carl Harry's is saying well help me then if you're a nurse help me compress his wounds and maybe we can save him. His wounds however were just far too severe. The 16th and final victim of Michael Ryan's 60 minute massacre was 34 year old father Ian Playle. As Harry's was kind of sat there with Mrs Playle he was approached by another man, a neighbour that had come out of a house which was actually Myra Gita's boyfriend. If you remember the woman that Michael Ryan had shot through the window and he said my girlfriend's injured I need you to come and help. The boyfriend led him to the house where Myra was laid on the bed and she'd been shot in the thigh and it was clearly very very bad. So Carl Harry's kind of bandaged it up as best as he could with like towels and stuff, told her boyfriend how to apply pressure to it and said look you're gonna have to do this and wait for the ambulance to come, I've got to go back out and go and help other people. So Carl Harry's got back outside onto the road when another neighbour approached him and said I think I saw the gunman go into that house over there which was Michael Jennings house. So Harry's ran over to Jennings house and he was banging on the front door but no one was answering and he was yelling, he was saying look I'm here to help you, the gunman's gone, he was banging on the door but still no one was answering, he couldn't even hear any noise from inside the house. So Harry's bent down and looked through the post box on the door and he could see a man sat in the stairs in the hall and so he shouted to him, he was like are you okay, what, what's happened? And Michael Jennings replied that he'd been shot. So Carl Harris is saying well let me in, I can like bandage up your wound and unfortunately Michael Jennings had locked the door and he couldn't really get himself up because he'd been shot in the leg so he couldn't walk to the door to unlock it. And so Harry's is saying well do you want me to try and knock it down, I can try and smash through the glass on the door and unlock it or whatever and Michael said no he thought he could do it and so he dragged himself across the floor to the door and unlocked it. Harry's ended up having to like kind of lift him up and carry him back to the stairs where he sat him down, bandaged up his wounds again, told him how to apply pressure to his own wounds and said that he had to get back out there. Before Harry's left the house, Michael Jennings said, well you might want to go next door, I think I heard the gunman go in my next door neighbour's house as well. So Harry's walks round to the Gibbs's house and immediately it's way worse than he expected. The full front door was just basically like a glass door and it was all shot through. So Harry's very bravely goes into this house, for all he knew Michael Ryan could still be in there. So he went in the house and he was being very strategic. Of course if Michael Ryan was still in that house he needed to keep his wits about him. So he was staying low, he was staying to the walls and everything and he was thinking so much about 
potentially being seen that he forgot to look at his foot in and accidentally stepped on a huge pile of smashed glass, which of course made a very, very loud noise. So now Harry's is panicking. If the gunman was still in that house, he definitely just heard that and he would probably come down to finish the job. And so Harry's is thinking, well, if he's in here, I'm dead. He waited about 20 seconds and he didn't hear any movement from upstairs. And so he thought, well, surely if Michael Ryan had been in there and heard that, he would have come down. And then he heard noises coming from the kitchen, but it wasn't a man. It was a woman's voice, an old woman's voice. It was Myrtle Gibbs and she was begging him to come and help her and her husband. So Carl Harry's got into the kitchen and the whole thing was just covered in blood. Myrtle Gibbs and her husband Victor, also known as Jack, they were both laid on the floor. Jack was over the top of Myrtle and it was very clear that he'd tried to save his wife. He tried to jump in front of her and take the bullets for her. And immediately, Carl Harry's realised that Jack Gibbs was deceased already and there was no use even trying to help him. He needed to focus all his attention on Myrtle. He grabbed Myrtle and kind of pulled her to the side. He was bandaging up her wounds and everything and the whole time all she could think about was her husband. She's saying, is he all right? Is he going to make it? And Carl Harry's just had to say to her, look, he's gone. We, we can't be worrying about him. We need to be worrying about you and making sure that you survive. Carl managed to help Myrtle with her injuries as best as he could until the ambulance got there anyway and she managed to go to hospital. However, two days later, she passed away from her injuries. But as I'm sure you can imagine, in this time that Carl Harry's is running from house to house, looking after all these survivors, Michael Ryan had moved on and he was going elsewhere. And police still had no idea where he was. The helicopter couldn't find him and he was still to be taken down. Until now, he'd just been kind of walking the streets aimlessly, just looking for new victims. He didn't care where he was going. He was just more kind of following noises to know that there were people in those houses or on those streets. But this time he actually had a purpose. He knew where he was going. He decided to go and end the massacre at his old high school, John O'Gaunt Community College. On his way there, he did attempt one last murder on a whim. I don't think he was planning on doing this, but it just, the man was right there. He turned to the side and saw 66 year old George Noon in his porch and Michael just shot at him. George was hit by the bullet and seriously injured, however he did survive. So Michael Ryan made his way to John O'Gaunt Community College and the school was completely empty because it was the summer holidays. The kids weren't there, teachers weren't there, no kind of staff, not even cleaners were there. And so he went in and locked the doors behind him, locking himself in. Michael, at this point, had spotted the police helicopter, which was kind of hovering over the school. So he knew that police were probably on their way. There was probably going to be a huge firearm squad. There was potentially going to be a standoff. He knew that this was over. Michael began shooting at the police helicopter, but eventually I think he just realised that it was no use. The bullets were barely even reaching the helicopter. No one was injured. The helicopter wasn't even damaged, I don't think. So the firearm squad arrives at the school and they know that they've got to strategically make their way over there because they need to be within firing range of the windows of the school in case he starts shooting at them, they need to be able to shoot him back. But of course, that means if they're that close, that they could be killed. So they're trying to get closer without, you know, drawing too much attention to themselves. So they're like climbing walls and diving through bushes and stuff. It was some mad mission. And the firearm squad was there with no kind of communication from Michael Ryan for about three hours. They could see him moving about inside the school, but he wasn't saying anything. He wasn't shooting at them. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't doing anything, but it was still too dangerous to try and go there because he still had a gun and he could have still killed them. Eventually, after about four hours of this kind of silent standoff, one of the officers finally made contact with Michael Ryan. This officer shouted to him and asked him like what weapons he had, how much ammunition he had, and Michael replied that he only had his nine millimeter pistol left and a couple of rounds of ammunition. And this negotiation with this officer went on for another hour. 
leaving it five total hours that he was in this school. And the massacre started at half past 12, so he was in this school until 7 p.m. And the officer is trying to say to Michael, like, look, leave your weapon, just come out. If you give yourself up now, you won't be hurt. No one will shoot at you, we'll just arrest you, and that can be the end of it. But Michael was just constantly asking about his mother. Was his mother all right? Where was she? Like, has she survived? What are her injuries like? But he knew full well that he'd killed his own mother on South View. Now, this can be interpreted in a few different ways. Either he's being genuine and he genuinely doesn't know if she is okay or not because he could have been in such a psychotic rage that it was all just a blur to him and maybe he doesn't remember. He doesn't remember specific people that he shot. Maybe he just remembers shooting at her but he doesn't realise how many bullets he actually fired. And maybe he was just hoping that he injured her and that she was okay. However, of course, she did pass away very quickly after he shot her. But another reason that psychologists think he was saying this is because he kind of knew that he shot his mother and killed her, but he was just making sure because his mother was his life, his whole life. He depended on his mother, and if his mother was dead, there'd be no reason for him to carry on. There'd be no reason for him to give himself up. He didn't want to go on without his mother. So he was making sure whether she was dead or not before he decided what he was gonna do with himself. Police assured him that they would try and find out what happened to his mother. Of course, it would take a lot of different communication between them, the police station, the hospitals, the ambulances, everything like that. And he was just saying to police that he was not gonna leave the school until he found out what happened to his mother. However, towards the end of this negotiation, he was saying things like, I didn't mean to kill her. So he knew that his mother was dead. Psychologists have struggled to make sense of, you know, what he's talking about during this negotiation. They don't really know what he was trying to get or trying to say during this whole thing. One minute he's asking if she's okay, if she's alive, and then he's saying he didn't mean to kill her. He asked about how many casualties there'd been and of course police didn't tell him. They didn't want to give him the satisfaction of knowing how many people he'd killed or injured. And he was saying things to them like, Hungerford must be a bit of a mess by now. I wish I'd stayed in bed. And so many times through this hour long negotiation, police thought they had him. They thought they would got him calmed down enough to the point where he was gonna come out. But then at 6.52 PM, around six hours after the massacre had begun, police outside the school heard one single gunshot come from inside. Michael Ryan had taken his own life. He didn't even warn police, there was nothing dramatic, there were no threats, he just silently took his own life so that he didn't have to deal with the consequences of the heinous acts that he'd just committed. Michael Ryan's total death toll was 16. 17 including himself, and he also killed his dog, so whether you want to make that 16 because it was 16 victims, 17 because there were seven human deaths, or 18 because of the dog's death, and he injured 15 more people. So there were 31 human victims altogether, and the youngest victims were two 16-year-old girls. A lot of people lost their loved ones that day, and most people in Hungerford and the surrounding areas knew at least one person that had been affected by this massacre, be it a survivor or someone that actually lost their life. Many, many police officers actually resigned after taking part in this operation. They felt that they didn't want to go back to work either because they were too traumatised, because they felt inadequate, that they couldn't have stopped him sooner, or because they felt embarrassed and they didn't want to be part of a police force that could let this massacre get so bad. Most of the people that lived on South View moved away completely out of Hungerford, some of them, because they just couldn't be around the place where such events took place. The fire that Michael Ryan started in his own house eventually ended up affecting four houses on that street. So that's three other houses full of people's sentimental things, their belongings, you know, material things that they'd spent their life collecting. Michael Ryan destroyed all of that as well. Although some people that lived on Southview, including Sylvia Pascoe, if you remember the woman that went and dealt with that 16 year old girl's injuries, she decided to stay there. She wasn't gonna let Michael Ryan and his 
horrific acts ruined that street for her, the street that she loved and the community that she loved and had grown up in. It's unclear why Michael Ryan actually set fire to his house. People have theorised a lot of different things, maybe there was evidence in there. However, this whole massacre didn't seem that planned, so I don't know what kind of evidence that would be. Other people have theorised that maybe he just didn't want police going through his things. Maybe it was just a kind of pride thing. He didn't want his things going through after he was gone. He probably knew that he was going to take his own life at the end of this massacre, so why not take all his belongings with him and not give police the option to go through his things. Maybe it was just a possessive thing, maybe he just wanted the control. Most of the survivors that Carl Harry's treated that day, when they went to hospital, the doctors told them that if Carl Harry's hadn't helped them and kind of bandaged up their wounds and put pressure on them and, you know, helped them out, a lot of them would have probably lost their lives. The 16 year old girl, the one that was shot on Southview, the one that Sylvia Pascoe came and helped and, you know, bandaged up, if she would have lost just two or three more pints of blood, she would have lost her life. Carl Harry's, of course, saved multiple different lives that day. I have never seen bravery and level-headedness quite like that in a case before and I have researched a lot of cases. He was phenomenal. He went on to become a captain in the British Army again. Like I said, he was a former army man but after this incident he decided to go back and be in the army and he also won a lot of awards for his bravery including the Queen's Commendation for Bravery which is just lovely. 16 year old Alison Chapman and her mother that drove onto Southview right into Michael Ryan's kind of firing line, both of them survived, like I said. However, Alison Chapman will have a bullet lodged in her back for the rest of her life. I don't know why they haven't taken it out, maybe it would cause more problems to take it out, so that bullet has been in her back ever since 1987, and she's even given birth to a son, she might even have multiple children by now, but with that bullet in her back, which is insane. Before the massacre, there hadn't been a murder in Hungerford for 111 years. So that was since the 1800s. That's how unexpected this was. It was such a safe area. But the community's reaction to the massacre was so lovely. It was exactly as you would expect. There was a fund set up for the survivors and for, you know, paying for funeral costs because these were very unexpected deaths. Maybe a lot of these people hadn't been saving for funerals. Funerals were paid for, different healthcare things were paid for, even things down to like smashed windows because a lot of people's windows were shot through and not everyone can afford to replace four or five windows all at once. People were volunteering to do things for other people, volunteering to help clean up smashed glass and things like that. The next morning after the massacre, the local church held a full service and hundreds of people turned up. And as I'm sure you can imagine, the town was absolutely crawling with journalists for the next couple of weeks, which is to be expected, but at the same time, it it wasn't even very respectful in this instance. A lot of people recall feeling very exploited with the way that journalists were dealing with this. They didn't care about Hungerford, they didn't care about the survivors, they didn't care about the people that had been through this, they just cared about the story. The press coverage of Douglas Wainwright's death was probably the worst of all of them. Douglas Wainwright was PC Wainwright's father who was coming with his wife to come and surprise his son that day. And the press clung to the fact that PC Wainwright had actually signed Michael Ryan's approval form to get him a license to own the guns that he eventually killed PC Wainwright's father with. Of course, PC Wainwright isn't to blame. Michael Ryan didn't have a previous criminal record, no serious mental health concerns. There was no reason for him not to own these guns. There was nothing that PC Wainwright could have seen that could have predicted this. The media printed headlines like, PC signed his own father's death warrant, which is just disgusting. It shows that British tabloids then and still now have always just been insensitive and horrific. As a result of this massacre, major law changes were made in the UK and very quickly as well. That's one thing I love about this case is that the government were very quick to react and to help and save their citizens. The Firearms Amendment Act was passed which banned the personal ownership of semi-automatic rifles. Just like that. All it took was one massacre 
and semi-automatics were banned in this country. You can only get them like if you're a police officer or something now. One of the most frustrating things about this case is that no one knows why. Because of course he was such a loner, he didn't tell anyone anything. If he'd written anything down it was burnt down in the house fire. The only person that was close to him was his mother and she was dead too. No one knew why Michael Ryan targeted the people that he targeted. Of course it did seem rather random but he seemed to stick on his street for a while so was it something against his personal neighbours? Maybe he was just taking out his anger on Hungerford or humanity as a whole. He never fit in and he was jealous of these people, he envied them. Like I said earlier, one thing you might have noticed about Michael Ryan is that he never targeted children. He had plenty of opportunities to shoot and kill children but he didn't, which is very interesting to me. If he was in a blind kind of psychotic episode, surely he would be shooting at anyone and everyone he came in contact with. The fact that he spared children shows me that he has some kind of conscious thought. He knew that he didn't want to kill children so he decided not to in that time so he was thinking rationally to a degree. So maybe he was thinking properly, maybe he wasn't in a kind of episode, maybe he was just a cold-hearted killer but other people think that he was targeting older people, you know, people his age and up because they were the ones that weren't accepting him into society. They were the ones that had successfully integrated into society and he was looking at them like they were different and like they wouldn't let him in. So he was taking that anger out on them. Maybe he was just jealous of normal people because that's what all his victims were. They were just normal people living normal lives on normal roads, doing normal day-to-day -day things, having picnics with their families, you know, driving to and from work out in the garden with their significant other. They were just doing very mundane tasks that Michael Ryan couldn't even do because he couldn't fit in. But unfortunately we'll never know why he targeted who he targeted, why he even did this at all. Some sources say that Michael Ryan's autopsy showed that he had no abnormalities in his brain. Now I don't know how true this is because, like I say, I only found it on some sources. But sometimes when people are severely mentally ill, you can tell by looking at their brain. Maybe it's kind of malformed, maybe there's a tumour, maybe there's, you know, something physically wrong with the brain rather than just hormone levels. And his autopsy showed that his brain seemed normal, healthy, from the, you know, physical makeup anyway. But again, I don't know how true that is. But yeah, that completes this video. Thank you so, so much for watching both parts. What do you think to, you know, these new little series that I'm doing, should I stop? <laughs> I think my kind of rule of thumb for whether I'm gonna do it as a full video or as a series is if it's way over an hour long. So I can deal with like an hour, an hour and 10 minutes, maybe even an hour and 15, but if it's anything over that, I think I'm gonna split it into two because I personally can't sit and watch an hour and a half of the same thing constantly. I don't know how you guys do it. You say that you can, but I don't believe you. But yeah, thank you for watching this anyway. It means the world to me. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up and subscribe down below if you wanna see some more from me. I make videos like this all the time. A huge thank you to all of my channel members. All of their names are on screen right now. If you want to become a channel member, you can click the link in the description or click the join button if you're on a desktop. There's two tiers to choose from. Everyone on tiers one and two will get access to a community page where you can suggest cases and get your requests fast-tracked. And exclusive to tier two members, they will get their name on this end screen at the end of every single video. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!